Okay, how's that? Let's start again. The only magic trick I know is to put a straw in a potato. If you didn't know the science behind how to put a straw through a potato, because there is science involved, you might just stand up here and try and stab the straw with the potato, and it wouldn't work very well. And this is a particularly big potato. This is the one I bought in Seattle, Seattle potato. But if you know the science behind how to get a straw through a potato, then you can put a straw through a potato, and it's not difficult. Okay? So why the heck am I doing this? Because there's a science behind how to get people to do what you want them to do. And I think what most of us do when we're trying to get people to do stuff, whether we're trying to get our boss to fund our next UX project, if we're trying to get a client to implement our recommendations, if we're trying to get our spouse or roommate to take out the trash, whatever it is, we tend to try the same things we've always tried before. And sometimes they work, and a lot of times they don't work, and we don't really understand why. So what I'm going to do is do the equivalent of teaching you how to put the straw in the potato. Uh, and I'll tell you, you want me to tell you what that is? Because sometimes I don't tell people, and then it's like they're waiting. An hour and a half goes by. When are you going to tell us about the? All right, to get the straw through potato, there's, it's pretty simple. There's two things. One is you have to cover up the top of the straw so that the air doesn't go through. And the other thing is you have to do it with, um, there has to be like a follow through. If you just kind of stab, it doesn't work. So you have to really, you know, have not a lot of force, but you have to follow through with it. Okay. Now you can be a famous magician in your family. All right. So we're going to talk about how to get people to do stuff. And this is based on my book of the same name. And there are uh, seven drivers of human motivation. Seven main reasons why people do what they do. And what we're going to do in our session today is we're going to go through all seven. I'll tell you some of the research behind it. I'll give you some examples of them. And uh, what we're also going to do is um, somewhere in here, I'm going to have you make, get together with a team of people and actually have you try this out. So I want you to be thinking ahead of time. As we go through all of these, I want you to think about one or one of two situations. So situation one is maybe you have a product that you're designing, a website, an app, a device. And as part of that product, you are trying to get the users of that product to do something. We want them to register at the website. We want them to sign up. We want them to use the app every day. I mean, whatever is the behavior you're trying to get the people to do with the thing you're designing. So that's scenario one. And so in our session, I want you to be thinking as we go along whether the things I'm talking about could be useful when you're trying to get people to do that. Uh, and then we'll have an exercise towards the end where you will actually, I'll ask you to, to do it. And it'll be easy. Don't worry about it. Because once we go through all these, it'll become clear. Another possible scenario you have is not that you want to apply this to design, but you want to apply this to people. Like, yeah, I really do want to get my boss to fund this research I'm trying to do. I really want to convince this client to do X or Y. So you can apply this stuff to that situation, too. But I want you to decide, and it might be hard to decide, but I want you to pick one of those scenarios. Either I'm going to, today in our workshop, I'm going to apply what she's talking about to this design project I have, or today in the workshop, I'm going to apply it to this people situation I have trying to get people to do something not necessarily to do with design. Make sense? So start thinking about that as we go through. And then there'll be a point at which I'll say, OK, now we're going to do our case study. Which one are you doing? All right. All right, so we have these seven ideas. Now, in the book, um, there's a total of 141 strategies that go with these seven. And I can tell you right now, we're not covering all 141 <laughs> today. But I'll try and cover enough of, for each so that you have a sense of how it works. The first one we're going to do is the, the power of stories. Now, stories are powerful in two ways. And when I say the power of stories, what you might think of is, oh, yeah, if you tell stories at the website, you know, you tell a customer experience story that is really powerful. And, and it is, and I do mean that, and I do talk about that in, in the book. But I want to actually um, 
delve a little bit into the way stories are powerful in another way for our workshop here today, which is the self stories, the stories that people tell themselves about who they are and why they're doing what they're doing. Because that's extremely powerful and that's something that is often overlooked. I think many of you already know that if you use stories in, you know, customer experience stories, that'll be, that'll be powerful. I want to talk about self stories and here's the example I want to start with. You may notice, oh, I forgot the quiz. Uh, okay, we got to do the quiz first. Paper and pencil or notebooks, laptops, tablets if you must. Okay, I want you to uh, take this quiz. You can work alone or with a partner. Uh, and we're actually not going to go over it till the very end. But let's see how you answer now and then we'll come back. So the number one, the best, just write true T or F. The best way to get long-term behavior change is to get people to change their own self stories. True or false? Long-term behavior change. Number two, if you want people to think about a question logically, use a hard to read font. True or false? Ooh, if you were in the other session, you already know the answer to number three. If you were out taking a late lunch, you don't know the answer. Number three, people can remember seven plus or minus two things. Number four, if you want people to take an action, use a verb instead of a noun. True or false? Number five, on average, it takes 63 days to create a new habit. Number six, when you want to establish a new behavior, you need to reward it every time. And number seven, if you want people to agree to what you're asking for, first ask them for more than what you really want. True or false? All right, so we'll go back over this when we're done today and see if you want to change your answers. All right, the power of stories. I want to start by telling a story that happened to me. Um, you may recognize this as an early generation iPod, right? So, uh, Years ago, when this first came out, um, my kids wanted a, their very own iPod. And at the time, I was not uh, very Apple friendly. Uh, I was a PC person, you know, the PC nerd. That was me. I had always used, uh, you know, PCs, Microsoft products. I'm not just saying that because I'm here in the state of Washington. It's, I tell the same story when I'm down in Silicon Valley. Um, so they want it, you know, it's like, oh, an Apple product, I don't know. My husband and I used to have these Apple PC wars because he used Apple products where he worked. He's a newspaper editor. And I was always making fun of him, you know, and he was always complaining because in our house everything was PC. So my kids wanted this Apple product, and I thought, well, okay, I'll buy one for them. I mean, you know, it's not a computer. It's just a music listening device. So I bought them iPods, and then I got a little jealous. It's like, I want one of these. You know, because I go for walks, it'd be nice to not carry. This was back in the day when if you didn't have an iPod, you carried around a Walkman. Remember those? Yeah. So I, I decided, all right, I'm going to get an iPod. So that was what I later came to term uh, a crack. And I call this in my book um, the crack strategy. And my children, who are now grown, uh, said to me, you really want to call something in your book a crack strategy? <laughs> It's like, why? What's wrong with that? You know, but I did anyway. So it's a crack strategy. Because by, buying, by me buying an Apple product, I had opened up a crack in my self-story, my persona. My persona was I'm a PC person, I'm not an Apple person. But I just bought an Apple product, right? This creates what in psychology we call cognitive dissonance, uncomfortable feeling. This is all happening below the surface unconsciously. I'm not even conscious that this is going on. So that's the first thing that happened, right? Then, okay, it came time to buy a new phone. And I thought, well, maybe I want an iPhone. So I bought an iPhone. The crack widens, right? Next, when it came time to buy a new laptop, guess what I purchased? Yeah, it's sitting right up here, and a MacBook. And then uh, after the MacBook, uh, came, you know, the next generation of iPhone, and then 
of course, I had to have Apple TV, and I had to have uh, the smaller iPods, and I had to have the, ta the iPad, and then the, there was the shuffle, and then we got the desktop. I didn't even realize this had happened until one day my husband walked into, uh, I, I have an office at home as well as at my office, and he walked into my home office, and I was, you know, on doing something on the laptop, uh, talking on the iPhone. I had the Apple TV going in the background, <laughs> you know, all these apps, and he walked in and he looked and he looked at me and he said, hey, when did this Apple thing happen, okay? <laughs> and it happened slowly over time, but the first crack was that first iPod purchase. So later, as I started reading about the research on self-stories, just when you want someone to change uh, a long-standing behavior, so, you know, I, I mean, I was, n I was not an Apple person, and I'd been a PC person for literally decades. When you want people to change set behavior like that, one way to do it is to introduce a small crack. You get them to do something very small that is a little nudge towards where you want them to be. Uh, it's very small, they don't even realize that they've cracked. And then over time, you can ask for a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more until they've done a total turnabout. So working with people's self-stories is extremely powerful. There's a book called Redirect um, by uh, uh, Anthony Wilson. And it's about the research on the power of self-stories to instigate long-term behavior change, which was one of your quiz questions, by the way. Um, probably the most powerful thing you can do if you want to get someone to make a, a big behavior change and make it over the long haul. You've got to get them to change their story that they tell themselves about who they are. So that's the power, one thing about the power of stories that I want to bring out. Um, next one I want to talk about is tricks of the mind. And if you were in the session before this, I started to talk about this a little bit. I showed, the, how many people were not in the session right before this? Anybody? Okay. So I mentioned about system one and thinking, right? And system two thinking. Which one is the 17 times 24? Is that system one or two? That's two. That's the hard, effortful thinking and system one being the easy intuitive thinking. Now we're gonna get into some details about this because this is really interesting. If we know that most of the time people walk around in system one thinking, we can actually use that in order to get people to do stuff because they're gonna be in system one mode unless something clicks them into system two mode and we'll talk about what that might be. I wanna start um, by showing you uh, a short video clip and um, this was done in the field and the audio is not that great a quality, so I have underneath, uh, the, especially the audio of me and another person asking the questions, so I put underneath what we're asking them so you can read that, but you'll be able to hear her giving her answer. Kahneman in his book talks about the fact that you can tell when someone is, in, is doing system one thinking versus system two thinking by the amount of dilation of their pupils, okay? It's really odd and very interesting. So I want, uh, we're, I'm gonna show you this on this film, so you gotta watch her pupils. Um, and what you'll see, it's subtle, so kinda watch carefully. First I'm gonna ask her about what's her favorite TV show. That is, do you think that's system one or system two? System one, system one. that's not a hard question, right? And, and then I'm gonna ask her a more difficult question. I'm gonna ask her to name uh, US states and their capitals, okay? And that's a system two kind of question. And when I ask her that, watch her pupils, because you'll see them start to, the pupils are the black part, and they'll get bigger, all right? And then I ask her another uh, system one question again. I ask her, what is her, fa or my, my colleague does, what's your favorite animal, all right? System one question, all right? So let's take a look. Well, <laughs> oh, come on. Okay. Really? Hmm. Not from here. Let's try.
So tell us about um, one of your favorite TV shows. Um, Lost is my favorite TV show. That's from a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, ABC. Okay. That's the Cayman Islands. <laughs> I was there. I took that photo. Uh, yeah, damn apples. Oh, I didn't say that. Hold on. That's so odd that it won't show it. You're going to get to see everything about Max. Well, I have, oh, oh, there we go. How about that? Yes? So tell us about um, one of your favorite TV shows. Um, Lost is my favorite TV show. That's from a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, ABC. And why do you like it? Because it's amazing. Yeah. Because it is completely cohesive, like, through the entire season. Okay. I have another question for you now. Different question. I'd like you to name as many capitals of states as you can remember. Name the capital and then name the state it goes with. I don't know a lot of capitals. Mm, try. <laughs> okay. Um, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, Springfield, Illinois, Juneau, Alaska, um, what's that place in New York? Albany, uh, Newark, is that New Jersey? Um, um, what's your favorite one? I think a koala bear. Why? Because they just hang out and um, eat a lot of bamboo and sleep, and they're really cute. Do you like that? Okay, so it was subtle, but did you see it? No. All right, um, let's try this. Want to try this? Uh, here's what I want you to do. I, and I'm going to explain it to you first because it's a big room, so as soon as I set you free, it's going to get really noisy in here. So here's the whole process. You're going to find a partner to work with, uh, and you're going to take turns about being the... Uh, experimenter versus the experimentee. So you'll both get a chance to do both. So if you're the experimenter, you're going to think up uh, two questions, right? One is going to, you start with a system one question that doesn't require a lot of thinking. So, you know, it might be what's your favorite TV show or, you know, where do you live or anything like that, right? And then you're going to do you're going to switch to a system two question. So think about, you know, it could be a multiplication problem. It could be something like, you know, countries, you know, uh, list the countries in the continent of Africa or something, right? Some question that we'll, they'll have to think about. And you're going to look to see if you can see their pupils dilating. Now, and then after you do that, it'll just take like, you know, a minute or less. Then you're going to switch. And the other person's going to think of questions and they're going to ask you. Now, some things to, to mention. When you are the one doing the talking, when you're the experimentee, uh, there, the tendency when someone asks you a question is to go like this. Um, let's see, you know. And if you do that, they cannot see your pupils, okay? So it'll be a little weird because you have to kind of stay still and, you know, maybe take off your glasses and kind of talk like that. So it'll, be a, it'll feel a little uncomfortable, but try. Just know that you're going to tend to, you know, move around. And that, that won't be helpful, all right? So you're going to find a partner, decide who goes first. You do a system one question first, then a system two, and then you switch, all right? Go for it. Find a partner. If you don't have a partner, raise your hand. So find the people whose hands are up.
Does everybody have a partner? Anyone need a partner? Um, here, there's a group of three. Go, Tet, and Trevor. Okay, can I get you to come back? This is the hard part, getting everyone back. All right, back to your original seats. All right. So, um, how many of you saw it? How many of you could see that? Yeah, some of you did. Some of you might not have been able to. It's subtle. Um, I do have to warn you that uh, there's another reason that people's pupils dilate besides system two thinking, and that's when they're attracted to the person they're talking to. <laughs> but I don't want to go there. OK, we're not going there. Now, Kahneman did an interesting thing. He would, he would have people in a lab, and he'd have a camera on them. Uh, and he'd be actually be in another room watching. He actually had the camera kind of in the hallway. And he had a speaker. You know, this is like a usability lab, right? A speaker um, so he could talk to them. And, uh, you know, he'd turn on the speaker and he'd say, okay, your first problem is, and, you know, they'd, he'd, they'd do the problem. And one of the things you can tell, um, actually, I don't know if you noticed it. You could, it was actually in this video I showed. You can tell when someone has given up. I don't know if you noticed in, in the video of this, this young woman, when uh, we, she was doing the state capitals, and then she kind of went, um, and then her pupils, <laughs> you know, it's like, so he would see that they had given up, and he'd actually come over the loudspeaker and go, don't give up, and they'd go, oh, how did he know? <laughs> how did he know that I'd given up? Right? All right, now I have to wend my way back to my uh, PowerPoint here. All right. Okay, subliminally going through all the slides we've done so far. So, the fact that we know, and I mentioned in, in the last session, we know that most mental processing is unconscious. Most of the time people are in this system one mode. So this creates some kind of interesting things. Here's a, here's a paragraph. In a lake there is a patch of lily pads. Every day the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half of the lake? Now, how many of you say it's 24 days? And how many of you say 47? Yeah. Now, the reason that, and 47 is the right answer. Um, most people, if you just get them on the street and you haven't been talking about system one and system two thinking, <laughs> and they're not alerted to all this, they're going to actually give you the answer 24. Even engineers will give you the answer 24. They're just not thinking it through, right? That system two logical thinking hasn't kicked in. Now, Daniel Kahneman did this kind of research, and he would take the same paragraph and he'd put it in a hard to read font. He'd make it italicized and, like, you know, color so that the background and foreground didn't have enough contrast. And what he found was that many more people got the question, what do you think, right or wrong? Right. right. Right, when the font was hard to read. Because the font was hard to read, and then the system one couldn't just roll along in its usual system one mode, and it would stop it cold, right? 
and, it, and system two would kick in. Essentially, system one kind of says, this is too hard, and backs off, and system two comes in. So I am therefore saying that you should always use a hard to read font. <laughs> Oops. You know. No, I'm not advocating that. But it is a very interesting point that if people really are making a very important decision that you need them to think about with their conscious brain, and we know that most of the time they're not, we have to do something to get them to stop and say, oh, I can't just approach this in my usual rolling along mode. I really need to think about it. And a hard to read font would do that. Um, but don't go back and say, Susan Weintraub says that we should make the font hard, hard to read. OK, another thing that happens with this tricks of the mind is the idea of anchoring. So people anchor on random numbers. It's a really weird thing. It's been documented in many, many studies. Here's an example. Uh, I say a sale on soup, a limit of 10 cans per person. If I say it that way versus I just say a sale on soup and I don't mention a limit, which way do people buy more soup? They buy more soup when I say there's a limit of 10. So here's, on average, they'll buy seven cans of soup if there's, I say there's a limit of 10. And if there's not a limit, they'll buy three. Right? What happens is they anchor on the number 10. The number 10 goes into their brain, and now when I'm deciding on soup, I buy more because the number 10's in my brain. Kahneman and others have done some very interesting research with this. Like they'll, um, they'll talk to people about, um, oh, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have a roulette wheel, and they spin the roulette wheel. That's a little game they play. And they have it rigged so that it only lands on a very high number or in a very low number. And then later on in the experiment, they'll ask them how many countries are in the UN. Totally unrelated question. Certainly the number I spun on the roulette wheel doesn't have any relationship to the number of countries in the United Nations. And yet people's answers will be based directly on which number on the roulette wheel they spun. When they spin the high number, then there's a lot of countries in the UN. When they spin the low number, there aren't very many. So we are just unconsciously affected by this. So if you, you know, the numbers you have, and you know, we do, we, there's numbers all over, you know, websites, all over websites. Um, you know, there's like high numbers up here, I think, of how many people have donated. But look what they, this is an interesting one. I put this one in red here. They're asking for donation. Which number should they, if they want higher donations, what should they put at the top? The higher number. We're actually anchoring people on a low number. Or right before they have these, they should say over 270,000 people have donated. How much would you like to donate? <laughs> you know, again, higher numbers. So people anchor on numbers. The system one thinking, you can use it to get people to do stuff. All right. That's an example of what I call tricks of the mind. Next, I want to talk about instincts. So uh, let's see, do I, do I have, yeah, picture, this is a, a very simplified picture of the brain showing the three main areas, new brain, mid brain, and old brain. So highly simplified. You know, I gave a talk um, once at the Mayo Clinic, and I had talked to the, per, the host beforehand, and I, and I thought it was the usability people that were coming to the talk, and then like five minutes before I go on, he says, oh, by the way, I opened this up to anyone at the clinic. So there's a bunch of neurosurgeons who said they were interested in it. And I'm like, oh, no. You know? And then I realized I had this slide in the presentation. <laughs> like, OK, somewhat simplified for a neurosurgeon, isn't it? Uh, they were fine. They were fine. You, we think we have one brain, but we really have three. We have the new brain where our conscious thought goes on. And I'm pointing to my forehead because that's where it is. We have the midbrain that I mentioned in the last talk, um, where the amygdala is, where social processing is. And then we have the old brain, which I also mentioned in the last talk. It's called the old brain because it evolved longest ago. We share the old brain with uh, reptiles and amphibians. Sometimes it's even called the reptilian brain. And the old brain is constantly scanning the environment, essentially saying, uh, can I eat it? Can I uh, have sex with it? Will it kill me? You know, That's what the old brain is doing. So our instincts about stuff comes from our old brain. And you know, this is a, our unconscious, when I talk about unconscious mental processing, that's going on um, in the midbrain, 
and in the old brain. And the new brain is where only, the only place where the conscious thought is really happening. So instinctually, we pay attention to uh, food, sex, and danger. Pictures of food, um, the mention of food, you know, pictures that imply so I could just cycle back through, back and forth through, and you're not listening to anything I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on. You know, pictures of danger. Those three things: food, sex, and danger really grab attention. I had a um, uh, person write me. They, I, I get emails from people who've read my books, and he had read uh, one of my books where I talked about this. And he said, you know, can I can I run this by you? We're going to redesign our homepage based on on what we've been reading. And uh, we manufacture cranes, you know, industrial cranes, like the big, tall crane. He said, so here's what we're thinking about doing on the homepage. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a young woman in a bikini. That's the sex part. And we're going to have her, we were thinking of having her hold like a tray of cupcakes, because that's, that's the food part. And then there's going to be a crane in the background, and there's going to be like something really big and heavy but it's kind of falling off the crane, like it might hit her, and that's the danger part. And I was like, oh my God, where do I even begin? I was like, okay, I didn't say to do that, you know? I think I talked him out of it. Um, but we do know that those three things will definitely get attention, and I mentioned before, we're more motivated by fear of loss. So if you are trying to make an argument to someone about why they should fund your project, uh, why they should listen to your results. We tend, I think, sometimes to give the positive about all the positive things that will happen if they implement my recommendations. What we should do instead, or at least in addition to, is tell them about all the bad things that will happen if they don't implement. Right? You're going to lose this, you're going to lose that. How many customers are you going to lose, 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 lose? Uh, and here's what happens with this unconscious conscious. Okay. The conscious brain wants a rational reason. The conscious brain wants to go to the board of directors and say, I funded this project because blah, 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 da, 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 and give a rational reason, reason. But the unconscious made that decision based on something entirely different, like, I'm afraid that if I don't fund this project, everything's going to go to hell, and I'm going to lose my job, right? But that'll all be unconscious, right? So if you want to get people to do stuff, though, you've got to tap into that unconscious. If, uh, one of the, um, you know, the, there are companies who their, their reason for being it has to do with fear of loss. And they're, you know, like insurance companies and, um, you know, property insurance companies, right? Fire, theft, or um, uh, uh, life lock, right? Identity theft, right? So if you're in a business like that, you know, you're, you, you're lucky in a way because you can use that, right? It's easy. When, if you're not in a business like that, you know, then it gets a little trickier, right? It gets a little trickier. I mean, if you're in healthcare, do you really want to splash all over, you know, the, the homepage? You know, you better come to us or you're going to die, right? I mean, you're, you know, you're probably not going to say that, not real sensitive. Um, but we have to understand that the fear, fear of loss, fear of death uh, is extremely, extremely motivating as well as food and sex. All right, next thing I want to talk about is what I call carrots and sticks. So how many of you took like general psychology when you were in college? And do you remember about um, uh, operant conditioning and B.F. Skinner and Ivan Pavlov? And that's where some of this stuff comes in. We're actually going to, we'll talk about Pavlov a little bit when we talk about habits. But I want to talk about um, operant conditioning. Um, so this was very popular. This, the, this theory, this branch of psychology started actually around the early 1960s. It became very popular, lasted in some places through to the mid-70s. And then other parts of psychology, like cognitive psychology, and, and, uh, uh, became more popular. And this kind of fell out of favor. Now it's actually back, back in favor. Um, uh, I have always thought it was extremely powerful. I used to do research with rats. Uh, in operant conditioning, and um, then I uh, also did research with my children <laughs> in operant conditioning. Uh, this works really well with um, animals and small children. Uh, it also does work with adults, but I'm going to put a caveat in here. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to tell you uh, which of these seven are the most powerful to use. Right? 
So as we, we're going to talk about rewards. And it's interesting because rewards is kind of the motivational driver that we're all the most familiar with, you know, because, right, I mean, we're just used to people giving us rewards or we're used to giving other people rewards. It's actually, it can, it's, it can be extremely powerful in certain situations. It's actually not the most powerful of all the seven. And what I usually tell people is don't go to this one first unless you have some very particular situations that I'll talk about. But it is the one we know, and it is powerful. So what Skinner codified is that you have a certain behavior that someone does, no matter what it is. And if you reinforce, or we would call that reward, and there are reasons why he didn't call it reward. He called them a reinforcement, a reinforcer. If you reinforce that behavior, then you'll get more of that behavior. Right? So I'll give you an example. If you have a child and you want them to get an A on their report card, if they bring home an A, you give them five bucks, then the theory is that then they'll get more A's, right? Or uh, if you're in a uh, casino and you want someone to push the button, you give them some money and then they'll keep pushing the button. Or if you want someone to turn in a report on time, you praise them when they do and then they'll turn their next report in on time as well. That's the kind of basic theory. So there's a behavior. When the person exhibits the behavior, you give a reward, and then you'll get more of the behavior. And it does, um, it does work, uh, um, but there are caveats to it. Uh, and actually, let me before I talk about negative reinforcement, here are the things we know about reinforcement. Uh, it's very important what the reward is, because it has to be a reward for that particular individual. right? So uh, if you're using food as a reward and the person isn't hungry, it's not much of a re reward, right? Or if you, um, uh, if you use praise as the reward, but they could care less whether you give them praise or not, then that's not a reward. So sometimes it's tricky because you've got to find what is actually, what does this person feel is a reward? For instance, a lot of times, you know, salespeople will meet your quota and will send you to Las Vegas. But if I already do a lot of traveling and, and I don't want to be away from my family and I don't like Las Vegas, then that's not a reward for me. That's like punishment, right? You're going to make me go to Las Vegas. So you have to find out what's the reward for that person in order for it to be effective. There are many schedules of reinforcement, variable ratio, variable interval, fixed interval. I go into all that in the book, but let me just say that when you are when you want someone to do something they've not done before, it's a new behavior, you have to reward it every time. That was one of the quiz questions. Initially, you reward it every time to establish that behavior. But as soon as it's established, you need to back off. Because behavior will last longest over time if it is rewarded, uh, not every time, but in, a, in what seems to, to the person to be a random way. Think about casinos. Think about slot machines. Okay, When you put the money in the slot machine and push the button, do you win every time? Well, if they want you to play, why don't they give you a little bit of money every time? Because actually, you would play less. So they don't make you win every time. They, they, it's, it, you don't know do you? It's unpredictable. I don't know how often I'm going to win. I don't know if I'm going to win at all. I don't know how much I'm going to win most of the time. And that actually increases the behavior. Casinos, by the way, know all the stuff. They, know every, they have studied all the research on rewards and reinforcements. Uh, when we get to the section on habits and on Pavlovian, we can come back to the casinos because they even know what to do with the bells and the lights in order to get you to play more. So they, believe me, they are masters at psychology. Um, so we know that if we want to uh, establish a new behavior, we, we reward every time and uh, then we back off. The other thing is if you're doing the kind of reward schedule, like there's some, um, uh, you know when you have a little card and you get a cup of coffee and they punch your card and then after you do it 10 times, right? Uh, when, when people get to the end and their card's filled up and they get their free coffee, there's actually then a drop in behavior. So be careful of rewarding. If you, you might have customer rewards in, with your customers, and you know if they 
use the service a certain number of times and give them a free month, just know that when they hit the freebie, then for a while they're going to dip and you may have to figure out how to get them back. It may actually be detrimental. All right, negative reinforcement, by the way, is when positive reinforcement, I have a behavior, I want more of the behavior, I give you something you want to increase the behavior. Negative reinforcement, I take away uh, what someone doesn't want in order to increase the behavior. I take away something you don't want so the behavior goes up. And punishment is really different because in punishment, I don't want the behavior to go up. I don't want more of it, do I? I want less of it. So I'm giving you something you don't want in order to decrease behavior. Punishment does not work very well. It'll work just right immediately and then as soon as the punishment is gone, they're back to what they were doing. So it's not an effective way to get people to do stuff. All right, we have two more and then we're going to put it to work in your case study. The need to belong. Oh, oh hey, I need, I need uh, seven brave souls to volunteer and come up here and help me do a demonstration. Seven people. So I have seven, I have one, two, three, come on up. Four, five, I need two more, six, seven. Okay, come on up. Uh, you don't have to come all the way up here. So you see down here, I have a, a variety of musical instruments. Um, these round things, pick one up and bang on it. They sound like drums. You can check that out. Right, right. I got a cowbell over here. Someone want the cowbell. I have little ones. That's a wood block. I have a shaker. Okay. So I'm going to come down here with you guys. Line up in a, in a line facing our group here uh, and kind of get to bunch together. And you guys are now our uh, drumming band. And so I would like you to give us a concert. Have a hand for our drumming band. Very good. Thank you. You may put your instruments down and go back. All right. You guys are great. Thank you. They heard you. Very good. And they agree. Uh, yeah, people love it when they're next to me and I'm giving a workshop. All right. So, why did I have them do that? First of all, let me ask what did you notice about the concert? What did you notice? Pardon? They, uh, they kind of started disparate, but then they were kind of together, right? They synced up together in rhythm. What else did you notice? Anything else? Pardon? They were looking at each other. They were also looking at me. Did you see them? Like, get us out of here. Well, yeah, how long do we have to do this? And I found you guys were looking at me, too. How is she? What is she doing now? How, what are we doing here? Right. Anything else you notice? It was a kind of a primitive beat, probably because they didn't know what else to do, but yeah. Was there a leader? There was one person kind of emerged as the leader, right? So the reason I had them do this is I want to talk about the need to belong. Humans have this innate need to be part of a tribe and to belong. And um, it's very powerful and will, will affect their behavior very deeply. So the seven up here, they were... Um, they, they, you know, they wanted to be together. Yeah, I mean, they didn't want to, but they'd volunteered. But they, now that they were up here, you know, they wanted to try and play together. They were really trying to do something together. Uh, what we know is that when people do a synchronous behavior together, especially one that involves rhythmic uh, behavior, it bonds the group. I expect we'll see those seven roaming the halls the rest of the conference <laughs> together as a tight knit. But it really does bond the group. There's even research that show, for instance, when people sing together, their heartbeats start syncing in the same rhythm. Right? This is a biological, uh, it's built into us to be part of the tribe and be part of a group. And we're parts of many groups, right? We have our family, we have the people we work with, we have our neighborhood, maybe we have a church. So a very strong need to belong. And people will behave uh, in certain ways to go along with the group. They do not want to be exiled from the group. 
So if you can invoke the group, okay, if you can, uh, and this has to do with knowing who your target audience is, right? How do they think of themselves? What group do they affiliate with? Can you talk about what the rest of the group is doing because then they'll want to go in and be part of that group? Uh, is there a group that they could join? Do you even use words like join? Uh, uh, there is research that shows um, that, I uh, don't know if I have a picture of it here, there's University of Wisconsin, the other UW. Uh, you know, when people, I, I said rhythmic behavior, right? So they do these cheers and these chants at the football game, that bonds the group. Um, I was speaking earlier this morning with someone from Walmart, and we were talking about the Walmart cheer that they do in the store. It bonds the group, right? They say the same thing, they say it together, it's in rhythm, it will bond the group. Uh, just clapping will bond the group. Laughing together bonds the group. So if you have a group of people and you want them to get them to do stuff, you need to think, is there something they can do? I mean, I'm not suggesting necessarily that you bring the drums to the next meeting, but you could. But uh, is there something that you can do, though, to get the group doing something together, especially rhythmically? You know, dancing bonds the group. Singing bonds the group, clapping bonds the group. Gregory Walton has done a lot of research on this. He found, he, he would um, bring people in uh, for the experiment, and uh, they'd be sitting, and there'd be uh, someone on a treadmill, jogging on a treadmill in the room. And if he, the experimenter would mention to the person that came in and sat down and say, oh, you know, Bill over there, he's doing a different experiment, he's jogging over there. Did you know that you guys have the same birth date? the person sitting's heart rate will start to match the jogger when all they have in common is that they have the same birth date, right? This is how biologically strong this is. So what we find, this is one of the quiz questions, is that actually when you refer to uh, nouns, that will often get more behavior than verbs. So uh, Walton did this research. He would call people up. He'd say, how important is it to you to be a voter in tomorrow's election versus how important is it to you to vote in tomorrow's election? And when he said be a voter, that invokes a sense of group, right? I'm not just going to vote, I'm actually a voter. It is invoking the self persona. It says I'm one of those people who vote. I have actually been using this. I've been experimenting with this and I've been had my clients use it. I have a nonprofit client who wanted more donations coming through their website. And they had a button that said, donate now. And we, I said, switch it to be a donor, right? Be a donor. And that raised their donation level, just switching the word. Because now I'm a, I'm, I'm a person, you know, I'm a donor, I'm part of this group. And then we even experimented more, um, be a member of the organization, not just a donor, but be a member. So these words that we use can be really powerful if they invoke a sense of belonging. Uh, along with this need to belong, uh, Latane and Darley did research uh, on social validation. So they, they would take someone, uh, they, an actor, and they'd dress him up in a way where you couldn't tell, you know, he wasn't dressed really nice, he wasn't exactly dressed badly, but kind of in between, and then they'd have him like, go over and kind of uh, and moan, and you couldn't tell, is he hurt, is he sick, is he having a heart attack, is he drunk, what's the problem? And then they would see, would people stop and give him help? And what they found was that when people came by, if one person came by, they would give help 85% of the time. But if there was a group of people coming by, they would give help much less, 31% of the time. And the reason is, if if you came by and there were other people around, you'd look to see, are you, are you going to help? Are you going to help? No, nobody's helping. Okay, I'm not going to help either. We're very affected by other people, which is why, of course, reviews and ratings and testimonials are so powerful, really powerful. The, um, this guy, Chen, uh, tested whether, you know, what was more powerful, reviews and ratings by other people kind of like me versus reviews and ratings from the website owner versus uh, ratings from an expert. And all three had an effect, but the most powerful was if I thought the ratings and reviews were from people like me, right? Part of my group. Very, very powerful. Uh, work by Cialdini done years ago. Um, when you give a gift, uh, he would ask for a donation, 
Uh, without a gift, 18% of the people would donate with a gift, and the gift was free mailing labels. I know you've all gotten this in the mail, right? Not a very big gift, right? But then it doubled. The number of people doubled. It doubled because when someone gives me a gift, I feel like I need to give you a gift back. Social belonging. Uh, this was one of the quiz questions. Also Cialdini, he asked, um, will you be a chaperone for a group of teens at risk? He actually used the term juvenile delinquent. It was a few years ago. That's kind of a weird term these days. Uh, would you be a chaperone for a one-day trip to the zoo? Well, if he stopped people on the street, 17% of them would say yes. But if he first asked this other question, will you volunteer two hours every week to help teens at risk for two years? Much bigger commitment. Nobody said yes. Then he asked that, that other question. Okay, well, will you be a chaperone for a group of teens? Look, 50% of the people said yes instead of 17. And not only that, what he found out was uh, when it came time to do it, they actually showed up. Up in the first condition, 50% of the people actually showed up. In the second condition, 85% showed up. So not only were they more willing, they were more committed. And this is called concession. You ask for more than what you want. Then people say no, but they feel guilty. They have turned you down. And so when you ask them for something that is now less, they say, OK, I'll do that. All right, habits. I mentioned Ivan Pavlov. Um, Pavlov did that work, you know the work with the dogs and the bell, right? So he would feed, he was actually studying digestion. He was studying saliva at, in dogs. And what he found was he would, he would put meat in front of them and they would start salivating before they even took a bite. And then what he found was that when they heard the footsteps of the worker coming to feed them, they would start salivating at the footsteps or at the sound of the bell over the door. And he was the first, this is Ivan Pavlov in the early 1900s, he was the first one to put this together. He called it stimulus and response. Uh, so the, I show, we show the meat and they salivate. We pair the meat and the bell and they salivate. We just do the bell and they salivate. Now I want you to tell me what, in mo what modern day technology uses Pavlovian conditioning on you? Your, your smartphones, right? In what way? What do they do? Notifications and alerts. There's that little ding. And this ding means you have an email message. And that ding means that you have a text message, right? And how many of you have a really hard time not checking when you hear that? Right, right. It's like you want to go check. Um, and it's Pavlovian conditioning. It's the same thing. You are conditioned when you hear that sound to go check. When you see the little message pops up on your email, you go look. It, and it's actually also related to dopamine. There's a little bit of dopamine released every time you do that, and then you get in a dopamine lo loop, and you have to keep going, keep going. And there's research to show that that, is, that kind of al responding to alerts um, exhausts your uh, uh, whole adrenal system. So it's exhausting to do this. But that's what's going on. So if you want to stop it, by the way, you've got to turn off all the alerts. And then everyone will complain. I texted you. You didn't respond, right? And then just tell them, well, I'm on a Pavlovian diet. You know? <laughs> and they'll go, is that like paleo? And you can just say, yeah, just like paleo. <laughs> so, but this is how habits work. So think about habits. There's a great book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And I think he does a great job explaining this. So, you know, we've all heard habits are really hard to change and habits are hard to make. They're not. Another quiz question. They're actually really easy. Really easy. Think about all the things you do in a day that are habitual that you didn't, e you don't even remember how you got the habit. You know, put your keys in the same pocket every day. You drive the same way to work. All habit. Really easy. But here's the thing. You have to tie the habit to an existing stimulus response. So you, you um, let's say that I want to drink, uh, what, what example do I give here? Uh, I want to take my vitamins every day, and I don't have a habit of doing that. So what I do is I wake up and I brush my teeth. Now that's a habit. I always do that. 
So now I pair the brushing of the teeth. That becomes the cue for the new behavior I want, which is take vitamins. You can very easily, he, um, BJ Fogg has a website called tinyhabits.com, and he, you can sign up and he walks you through this. And in a week, he has you create three new habits, and they will stick, and they will stick forever. I've tried it. So habits can be very easy to create, but they have to be really, really small. Um, online behavior, technology behavior. Anyone think of a way that you can use this to get people to do stuff that has to do with technology? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, so she said if you could tie the checking of email to your particular website or your app. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing you have to think of. You have to think about how can, what are they already doing, and they're doing habitually every day, and how can we tie into that? The other thing about habits is it, the behavior has to be really, really small to make it easy. Uh, one of the things that works really well um, is the app, like all the, all the fitness apps, because the only thing I have to do, if I can train myself to just, you know, put on the shoes and press go, and it tells me everything else I have to do. You know, It tells me when to walk, it tells me when to run, it tells me when to stop and when to cool down, and I don't have to, back to system one thinking, I don't have to think about it, right? That will be much easier to do. All right, and the last one is a desire for mastery. So we, we are very motivated to learn new things. We want to learn, we want to grow, and uh, we can use that to get people to do stuff. There are three main things that stimulate the desire for mastery. One is autonomy. People have to feel that they have control, some control over what they're doing and how they do it. If you want them to feel that they, uh, if you want to stimulate the desire for mastery, you have to give them autonomy. You have to give them feedback. I don't mean feedback as in, oh, you're doing such a wonderful job. I mean feedback on, you know, it, did it work or did it not work? This is, by the way, desire for mastery is a, a big part of that. Well, a lot of these are involved in games, but this is a big one, right? I get feedback. Did I kill the guy or not, right, on the screen? Did I, uh, did I shoot this? Did I shoot that? Did it work? Is this over there? I get instant feedback. So lots of feedback, lots of autonomy. And the last one is, um, to be in, uh, uh, to have the right level of challenge. If things are too easy, it's not going to kick in my desire for mastery. But if they're too hard, then I'm going to give up. So you got to find that, just that level. That's the other reason why games have all the levels. Because if I can find just the right amount of challenge, they'll keep going and keep going. Then, of course, as soon as they get that, I take them to the next level. Right? So those are the seven. Now let's talk about which ones are the most powerful in general. For your particular situation, it could be any of these seven, but in general, the ones that are the most powerful are the power of stories, the need to belong, and the desire for mastery. So if I've got a particular situation and you know, it's like, oh, I could do this, I could do that, I could use one of these, I'm going to first look at those three, the power of stories, the need to belong, and the desire for mastery, because I know those are really, really powerful. Now, that may not apply to my particular situation, and then I'll go to, to some of the others. The idea is that you think about the situation, and you think about the people, and you decide which of these are going to be the most powerful in that situation. So I want you to do this now. Remember, I told you before, think about either an app uh, or something you're designing, or think about people or a person you're trying to affect. So what I'd like you to do is get in, either work with a partner or maybe a group of three. I don't want you to, groups to get too big. So decide who you want to work with. And I want you to talk about your particular situation and I want you to decide two things I want you to write down. Which of these, you get to pick one or two, would be the most powerful for your situation. And then I want you to give, get very specific, exactly what are you going to do. So if you say, I think the power of stories, I think getting a crack in the persona, like she did, told with the Apple story, I think that would be, I think we could do that, and I think that would be powerful. I want you to say exactly what are you going to get them to do that starts the crack, right? If you say, I think rewards would work really well, exactly what kind of reward are you going to give, right? So you get to pick one or two and say exactly what you would do. And you, your partner or your team can help you make the decision. So if you have a team of two, there's, you take turns. If you have a team of three, take turns, but no more than three in a team. 
And I have to check, how are we on time, guys? Oh, good, we have time. So take about, um, uh, I'll check in with you in about 15 minutes, okay? And see, so you have about 15 minutes to work with your team, decide which ones you'd use and exactly what you would do. Now, if you have questions and you don't know what you're doing or you're stuck, raise your hand. I will circulate around and I'll come over and help if you have questions, all right? 15 minutes, find a partner or a team. Okay, let's see um, if we can get a couple of teams to share with us. I have a microphone here, I'll come down to you. So who would be willing to share what, what you talked about? Any volunteers here? I won't make you come up to the front of the room or anything, or bang on drums or, anybody? You know I'm gonna stand here until someone volunteers. There we go, okay. All right, coming to you. All right, so tell us what you were working on and what you came All up right. with. So we were uh, talking about this beer tasting app uh, that I'm working on as a personal project. Um, a lot of the beer tasting apps that are out there, you don't really, you just kind of vote on them and you rate it one to five and it just doesn't make sense. Um, but the alternative is rating beer quantitatively. So like you're like putting a lot of detailed information so people can actually get a good profile about it. But that leads to long forms and that historically doesn't work very well. So um, the idea that we were talking about was this idea of desire for mastery. So making it some kind of ramp up process so people feel like they're actually learning and they're being challenged by something that's in, in small doses. So it's not this long uh, ramp up process to becoming a really good beer taster, um, which might in turn make a habit out of it. Um, the other idea was the need to belong concept. So if your friend tried this beer and it matches your profile of beers that you like, you know, maybe just uh, giving them a notification or letting them know that they might also like it. Great, cool. good examples, thank you very much. All right, who else would like to share? We need a few more, it's a big room. All right. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about, is this being recorded? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a person who's challenging to work with. So we used uh, two methods. Who may or may not be in the room. No, no who thankfully is not in the room, okay. but you know, don't email them the video. Okay. <laughs> um, so two methods was um, tricks of the mind, where I was going to suggest um, giving them a, giving them a person who could do their entire strategy, which they would definitely say no to. And then follow-up question would be giving them a contractor who could assist with one part of their project, mm -hmm. which I know they would say yes to after that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was carrots and sticks. <laughs> they really hope, hopefully do not get this video because <laughs> 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 I've just revealed my, all my tricks. Um, the other one was carrots and sticks, and actually what we figured out was um, the reward that I would have traditionally given them for completing tasks isn't a reward that would resonate with them. Um, we figured that a reward that would res res resonate with them is public recognition. So, you know, emails, shout outs, great work, all that stuff would work really well with this type of person. Okay. That was it. Great. And uh, we'll send them the video. Uh. Okay. <laughs> one more. Do we have one more? I know we do. They're all the way over there. Okay. I'm coming. Oh, while I'm going over there, uh, I would like you guys to be thinking of any questions you have, because right after this, we're going to do some Q&A for a minute or two. So think about what questions you have for me. All right, and here's our third sharing. So um, similar to the gentleman over there, I originally thought it would be tricks of the mind. Um, but then in conversation, it came up to be the need to belong because it's a concession type of situation where I have a developer who always pushes back and is like, no, that's too much work. No, we can't do that. That's too much work. So when I go back, I'm just going to throw everything at them. We need to be responsive. We need to be omni-channel. We, you know, we need to do this and that and everything else. And when he looks at me and says, there's no way we can do that, just say, 
then can we just be responsive? Can we do that? <laughs> you know, and he's got to concede at some point because he's got to say yes to something. You know, <laughs> so that's what I was going to do. Good, good. All right, how about a hand for our three sharers? That was really good. Excellent. Okay, so I'll come back up here. Questions that you've thought about as we've gone through. Any questions you have about what we've been talking about? Yes. Oh, I shouldn't have taken the microphone. Uh, I will ask the question and I'll repeat it. Um, All right. That too. Yeah, okay, so the question is, how much does awareness of all this affect the behavior? So for instance, now that you guys know about all this, does that mean that you know, I, can't, I can't use it on you? you know, it won't work anymore. Um, actually, the answer is it doesn't affect it very much. Uh, it's I mean, this is all part of the way we're wired as humans. Um, it has to do with years and you know, eons and eons of evolution, so, and then most of it is unconscious. So even though you know about it, the only difference will be after the fact, at some point you'll go, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I think that, I just, I think that was a crack strategy, right? Um, but at the time, it, it probably will not make you aware, you know, more aware of what you're doing. It's interesting, Cialdini, who worked on, he, he wrote a book, Psychology of Influence, years and years ago, and then where he talked about a lot of these, um, and then he, uh, later, he wrote a book. Uh, oh, from in that in that book, by the way, he he took the he said, "I want to tell you about all these, so you won't fall prey to the influence anymore." Right? But then he realized that <laughs> years later, he wrote another book. And he's like, "Well, that doesn't work." You know, <laughs> his original idea was, "I'll tell everybody," and then it won't work anymore. But it still does. Uh, my children, by the way, um, very suspicious of anything I <laughs> ask them to do. Uh, my daughter will go. You're using that like psychology thing on me, aren't you? And I'm like, be like, no, really, I'm not. You are. You are. So I should do the opposite. I should do the opposite, right? And it just confuses her entire, entirely. Okay, another question. Yes. When is it better to just be straightforward and honest and not use these techniques? When is it better to be straightforward and honest and not use some of these techniques? Um, uh, you know, the thing is, I don't know that these are all about lying. I mean, you're going to design something. The button is going to say something, right? Uh, and and it, it's a really interesting question because it gets into the question you guys haven't asked yet, but I bet is on some of your brain, which is, is this ethical, right? So your question's kind of wending towards that. Uh, and it's a great question. and and. And, and I don't know if I totally know the answer to it. But because there's a very fine line, right? I mean, when we design, we design to tr so that people will do something. I mean, you know, it, we hope that most of the time we get to design things so that the actions people are taking are the actions they want to take and actions that are good for them and actions that are useful and actions that help the world. I mean, that's, you know, that's good. And, and it's great when you can do that, but you know, some of us are designing to sell refrigerators, right? I mean, we are. Now you could say, okay, but I'm only gonna design so that they only buy a refrigerator when their current refrigerator has totally died and is not functional, <laughs> right? But you know, is that really gonna happen? So what I'm trying to say is it's really a, you know, it's an interesting gray area, right? Uh, there, and there is a line, but you have to know where that line is for you. So, I mean, and we all have our own line over which, I, you know, there are lines over which I will not cross. There are probably things I could do to get people to do things and I won't, I won't work on that project. I just won't. Uh, if people ask me to, I won't. Um, so you have to kind of figure out where your line is. So back to your question about, you know, when is it best to be honest? I think often it's very good to be honest, but you know, what does honest mean? Does honest mean that I tell you how many people really have donated? Because I'm not, I'm not going to lie about. I'm not going to say 400,000 people have donated if only 2,000 have donated. 
but do I not tell you? You know, because I know if I tell you, it might influence you to also donate. You know, that's that fuzzy. So I don't think it's a matter of lying, and I think being straightforward can sometimes work. But the other thing you've got to understand is that when you're straightforward, when you say to someone, I really, you know, like your example, we really need to do all of these things, right? The, the reaction from that, it, you know, the, that person is probably not reacting from a conscious place, right? It's probably unconscious. So in a way, we, what we're doing is not lying, but trying to talk to the unconscious. But then again, I might just be rationalizing everything I do. <laughs> right? OK, another question? Yes. Okay, so she's saying, um, I said that, that fear uh, of loss was more powerful than anticipation of gain. And she said, is there a point at which it's just overwhelming? Because okay? you see this in marketing all the time because everyone's been to my talks. No, you know, Because the marketing people have known this for a while. But, so it's like, oh, be careful of this, be careful of that, be careful of this. And is there a point where you just reach you know, um, uh, satiation, right? And it doesn't affect me anymore. I mean, it is possible to habituate to... Um, fear, um, but uh, pro you know, seeing ads at websites and on TV is not going to be enough to habituate. I mean, the people that habituate to fear are the people who live, for instance, in really dangerous neighborhoods, or the people who are in a constantly in in war, and they will really get to the point. It does incredible damage to their nervous system and psychologically, but they will eventually get to the point where they're actually not seeing and not reacting anymore because it's just too much. But for the kinds of stuff that we're talking about, there's probably not that much habituation going on. Um, so it's still, you know, it's still powerful. It's still powerful. So it doesn't mean that you can't ever talk about, oh, and then this, this will be wonderful, and you'll also get that. Because remember, it depends on which thing you're going for, right? The fear angle is in uh, instincts, right? And, that's, and I didn't mention that as being one of the three most powerful, did I? I mean, it is very powerful. But you could go for, instead of saying, oh, be careful because you're going to lose this, you could go for, don't you want to join this wonderful group with all these great people just like you and use the need to belong, and then you're not using fear. Right? So you do want to mix it up. OK, I think it's time for us to go back to that quiz. Remember the quiz? And let's see uh, what our answers are to the quiz. So number one, the best way to get long-term behavior change is to get people to change their own self-stories. True or false? True. True. If you want people to think about a question logically, use a hard-to-read font. True. Uh, people can remember seven plus or minus things. False. If you want people to take an action, use a verb instead of a noun. False. On average, it takes 63 days to create a new habit. False. When you want to establish a new behavior, you need to reward it every time. <laughs> new behavior, true. Then you want to back off, right? Uh, if you want people to agree to what you're asking for, first ask them for more than what you really want. True, OK. So uh, if you want to learn more, oh, here's a quote I like. Dwight D. Eisenhower was president in the 1950s. Um, of the US. Motivation is the art of getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. I kind of like that definition. All right. Um, in this case, if you're interested in learning more, the book to get would be How to Get People to Do Stuff. And I mentioned these guys before, so I think that's it. Guys, you've been great. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your conference. Thank you.